Pandemonium is one of those weirdly popular games. It's managed to maintain a pretty big fan base over the years, in spite of the series' relatively short lifespan. At its core, the game is a very simple 2.5D platformer from the early days of 3D gaming. But by sticking to the tried and tested gameplay of 2D platformers and sprucing it up with some fancy 3D graphics and cool perspective shifts, this wasn't just an eye-catching game back in 1996, it also played way better than most of its fully 3D platformer counterparts at the time. And I think that's why the game has stood the test of time, it's one of those games you'd enjoy playing back when it first came out in 1996, but it still ends up being really fun today thanks to keeping the gameplay simple at a time when you were slated critically for doing so. Pandemonium features your standard fantasy setting, levels take place across the fantasy land of Lear where you will run and jump through spider-infested forests, ancient cities in the sky, castles, deserts, dungeons, all the staples are present here. The game has a very likeable fairy tale charm, and the two playable characters Nikki and Fargus are certainly a big part of this. I mean, where else are you going to play as a jester wearing Converse? There's also a third character called Sid, who is Fargus's sentient stick puppet pal, who is kind of included as a two-for-one deal with Fargus. The gameplay in Pandemonium is pretty much entirely running and jumping. Most enemies can be dispatched with a simple jump or a variety of ranged magic pickups, but each character also has a unique ability to differentiate them. Nikki can double jump, which as you could imagine comes in very handy in a game like this, and Fargus can attack enemies with his spin attack, nice if you prefer a more aggressive playstyle. Personally, I always play as Nikki because, I mean, she, she has a double jump, but regardless, Nikki and Fargus have always been two of the more memorable protagonists from the era for me, both in personality and design. Pandemonium's big gimmick at the time was the way the camera perspective would shift as you move throughout the levels. You're always playing on a fixed 2D plane, but the different angles gave the levels a lot more depth than allowed for some pretty cool level layouts. This was certainly a major selling point at the time, and while the feature is pretty cool, it wasn't always ideal since the camera had a habit of zooming in way too close from time to time, which can lead to a few unfortunate and unnecessary deaths. Pandemonium wasn't a perfect game by any means, the controls could sometimes feel a bit floaty, the bosses weren't the best you'll ever see, and the perspective changes could frustrate from time to time, but it's a charming game that anybody can pick up and enjoy, and has remained a cult classic today for that reason. It also doesn't hurt that the game was released across multiple platforms, from the PlayStation 1, the PC, Sega Saturn, Engage, even an iPhone port was released at some point, which I imagine is absolutely awful to play. There was even a unique version of the game released on the Sega Saturn in Japan called Magical Hoppers. The game replaces Nikki and Fargus with two new characters, and now also has a bunch of exclusive anime cutscenes, but other than that, it's the exact same game, just now featuring a bunny girl and a guy in blue spandex. Anyway, since we had a hit in our hands, it only made sense we'd see a follow-up shortly after, and that we did, one year later in 1997 with Pandemonium 2. Only this game isn't really as fondly remembered as the first. Generally speaking, people see it as an improvement on the existing formula gameplay-wise, but it also received a lot of negative critique from fans and critics alike. A big reason for this was a shift in the game's tone. Gone was the happy-go-lucky fantasy world of the first game, and in was a newer, darker, edgier pandemonium, straight up with new designs and personalities for the main characters. You see, this was a game launched at a time when Lara Croft was spearheading a commercial desire for more adult-focused titles, so apparently the publishers pushed for this game to appeal to an older audience. And with that, we go from Nikki and Fargus, the mischievous youngsters, to Nikki the sexy sorceress and Fargus the jester with severe mental health problems. Oh, and they're... Both kind of assholes now too. Another thing this game was criticised for is that it was really just more of the same. Now I've read people saying Pandemonium 2 feels more like an expansion pack to the first game rather than a true sequel and yeah to be fair this really is more of the same. The gameplay for the most part is completely unchanged from the first game. It just feels a little tighter and more refined. But with the ever increasing quality of fully 3D games being released at the time, to many, just refining the existing formula wasn't enough. And while I generally agree with people's critiques of this game, I also think it's kind of brilliant. Pandemonium 2 is a very unique and memorable game, and it's for a reason I never really see people mention, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I guess I'll start with a question. How do you transfer a 2.5D fantasy platformer for kids into an edgier game aimed at an older audience? Well, you make it weird. So look, the plot has never really been a major driving point in platformers of the era, but we'll briefly cover it just for context. So in the first game, you accidentally summon a giant beast which eats a city, and I mean, look, it happens to the best of us. So you've got to make your way through areas dotted around the land of Lear to reach something called the Wishing Engine, which will allow you to wish away the beast, a fun and simple setup. The ending of the first Pandemonium is amazing, by the way. Turns out since three people reached the Wishing Engine, Nikki, Fargus, and Sid, the puppet thing, 
they actually get three wishes rather than just one. Fergus wants to test the wishes to see if they work, so he wished for a chicken. I hereby wish for a chicken. Wish granted. You idiot. Why'd you do that? I just wanted to see if it would work. Nikki then promptly wishes away the giant beast. And the last wish was used up by Fargus saying that he wished people could be more like him, which, uh, worked pretty well. As for Pandemonium 2, in this game, a giant comet named The Comet of Infinite Possibilities is flying over the land of Lear, and this comet is said to have the power to make all your wildest wishes come true. So it's basically another wish orientated setup, and I mean, if it worked the first time, why not? Only this time you're in a race with the evil Goon Queen to reach the comet first. If you're wondering what goons are, they are the dumb blue enemies you see all across the series. Obviously you don't want an evil queen getting access to any powerful wish comet, so you set off to claim the comet for yourself, although not necessarily because you want to stop the queen, more so because you want the comet's power for your own twisted desires. Bow down before Nikki, Sorcerer Supreme, Ultra Vixen Incarnate. <laughs> I got big plans. Let's see. Ooh, I know. I yank off his pointy head, slap it on a stick, and scrub the sewer with him. Must touch. <laughs> Pretty. <laughs> Must touch <print>. fire. <laughs> now what, Puddin Lips? You boys up for a ride on a rocket? <laughs> yeah, they're not great people. Also, Fargus doesn't have Converse anymore, so I'm gonna have to dock the game a few points for that. The other major difference here outside of the character changes we already mentioned is that while the first game was rooted in standard fairy fantasy for the most part, Pandemonium 2 is not. I mean, the goal here is to reach a comet in space, and it seems like people are using rockets to get there, which is which is kind of odd for the setting, right? So now with the plot out of the way, we can jump into the game, and honestly, the best way to show you Pandemonium 2 is level by level, because it's a journey. And as with any good journey, we've got to start somewhere. Welcome to Goon City, a very traditional opening level for a platformer. Just so you're aware, we will be playing as Nikki throughout the game, cause as mentioned earlier, if you give me the choice of having a double jump or no double jump, I'm gonna take the double jump. But just so you're clued in, I will show you some Fargus gameplay shortly, just so you know what the differences between the two characters are in this game. This is a fine opening level, great for getting to grips with the controls and game mechanics. Everything here is pretty self-explanatory. You can jump and use bouncy platforms to reach bigger heights, move super fast down the slides, jump on enemies' heads to kill them, and as you could imagine, there are plenty of coins to collect as well. By the way, this game is a fiend for collectible coins. If you like collecting unnecessary amounts of stuff in video games, Pandemonium is the game for you. Levels are packed with coins everywhere. Different color coins give you different amounts, and if you collect 500, you get an extra life. But this game doesn't call them lives here. They are known as smiley faces. That's what the manual says. So we're gonna stick to the terminology. And just as a warning, I love collecting coins as much as the next guy, but I've learned to just let coins go in Pandemonium 2 because if I spent my time trying to collect every coin I see, I would lose my mind playing the game. So if you see me miss some coins, just be aware I do not care about them all that much. That being said though, this game does have one of the most satisfying coin pickup sounds in any game. So once again, if you're into collecting coins, this is the game for you. Goon City as a level feels very much like the first game, from the visuals to the music, and the reason for this is that the opening few levels are set in the Land of Lear, which is the setting for the first game. There's some new mechanics you're introduced to, climbing both vertically and horizontally is a brand new addition for this game. It doesn't seem like much nowadays, but we literally take anything we could back then. 
The level starts outside the city until you're eventually climbing over the rooftops and using washing lines to bounce yourself up and down. There's definitely a lot more verticality to the levels in this game. This level should also get you up to speed with Pandemonium's perspective changes, both in good ways like when you're hanging high above platforms below, and in bad ways like when the camera zooms in suddenly and you have no time to react to the enemy coming ahead of you. Thankfully this doesn't happen too much compared to the first game, but it does teach you very quickly to work on your reflexes, and most importantly, to take your time. Anyways, after collecting a handy fire magic projectile and remembering the enemy was there this time around, we finish up with Goon City and make our way to... Ice Prison is a nice step up in terms of challenge. It's not necessarily hard, but it's a much longer level and will punish you if you haven't learned to take your time by now. This would actually be a good time to talk about magic. Now, we have less magic options available in this game compared to the last one, but the two that we have available here are very useful. Magic pickups have infinite uses, but you lose them whenever you take a hit. The fire pickup lets Nikki shoot a ranged projectile which can be angled slightly after firing, and there's also an electric pickup which automatically locks onto nearby enemies and requires you to bash a button quick to kill them. This is by far the most useful magic in the game since you can kill enemies from pretty much any part of the screen as long as you're near enough to them. And since we're talking about magic, let's use this as an opportunity to briefly talk about Fargus as well. Fargus can't double jump as mentioned, but his moves in this game are a lot more useful than they were in the first. Fargus still has access to his roll attack, but now Fargus can also throw Sid as a projectile. And not only can you use this ability freely at any time, but it can be used to collect items in the distance as well, so it's very useful. Fargus also gets different magic to Nikki. Fire lets him set himself on fire, which is probably not a good thing. And electricity lets him, uh, inflate enemies? The different magic types allow for some unique paths in the levels depending on which character you play as. So for example, Nikki can't reach the higher platforms in this level because she can't jump high enough. Fargus on the other hand, in spite of not having a double jump, can inflate the enemies and use them to bounce up to higher platforms. You can also make them explode into pieces too, but that's much less useful. So Fargus is actually a really fun character to play as, but once again, Nikki has that double jump, so this is the last we'll see of him for a while. The main thing you'll be doing in this level is lots of climbing, both vertically and horizontally, and usually while trying to dodge boulders falling from above. The level actually has quite a few hazards to overcome, nothing too difficult, but you will be kept on your toes throughout. The forward facing spikes especially can be pretty rough if you're not paying attention. There's a fun section where you get to blast lots of goons with fireball power ups. It's also a good time to try stocking up on smileys. There's usually a good chunk of them around levels, but they nearly always require some sort of tricky platforming to get. Most levels have secret bonus areas as well, similarly usually requiring some tricky platforming to reach. This is a fun level, pretty long too, taking nearly 9 minutes to get through. I also really like this area's music, it's this kind of ominous tribal jam, but it's it's really catchy. The music here is once again composed by Burke Treishman, returning from the first game. His style is very distinct, but he's got a few surprises in store for this game's soundtrack. You'll see. We finish up the level going over a few icy slides full of spikes and jumps, and after one final long jump, we're donezo. Zorsha's lab is the first real stylistic change we've seen over the original game. Zorsha is the goon queen's name by the way, we'll meet her later, but for now this is her lab, which seems quite technologically advanced compared to anything we've seen in the series before. Now most of the enemies in this level are walking fish by the way, it's uh, probably best we don't ask questions on this one. This level is much tougher than the previous two, the whole thing is full of hazards, most of the platforms in this level will try to kill you, so you'd want to be on your toes the entire time. Come here, smiley face. Come here, you prick. This is a good level for explaining how keys work. Now, keys can do a whole lot of things. They make collectibles appear, they can open locked doors, and they can just outright teleport you to wherever the hell they want. Moral of the story, keys are good. This level features a few smaller open sections that you need to explore in order to find a key to progress, something we'll see a lot more of as the game goes on. This level has some great music too. It feels very much like a classic Pandemonium track mixed in with some more modern industrial elements. 
The last part of this level is a climb up tons of these electric platforms from the last area. It can be pretty tricky, but once you've made your way to the top and reached the big green gem, you've finished the level. Imagine having a gem that big. Is it really worth the effort, like? Hot Pants is the game's first boss level, where we fight this weird looking dragon. Don't know what the pink stuff is around its head, but I'm, I'm a big fan. Since this is the first boss in the game, this fight is, as you can imagine, pretty easy. You've got to hide underground when the dragon sprays fire across the stage and dodge the odd fire hazard and lunge from the dragon as well. To damage the boss, you've got to use these catapults to fire projectiles towards the dragon as it flies by in the background. It can be pretty tricky to get the timing down with the projectiles, and it can be also pretty difficult to tell if you're actually connecting your shots with the boss, but this fight should be over pretty quickly without too much trouble. When we're done, we hop into this weird flying lift thing, which brings us over to the observatory. Here the game gives us a super health pickup. Now just to briefly explain, Pandemonium uses a hit point system. In this game you start with 4 hit points and collecting these super health pickups gives you an additional 4 hit points up to a maximum of 16, which is frankly pretty bonkers. It doesn't stop you dying immediately whenever you fall off the stage, but get enough of these and you can outlast lots of the hazards later on in the game, so very very useful. Anyway, once we leave the observatory we hop into this conveniently placed rocket and blast ourselves off into space. Say goodbye to Lear, because things are about to take a turn. So here we are, we ditch our rocket and the next few levels of the game take place on the surface of the comet. And our first is Stan's the Man, a level about getting into a man named Stan's home. And how do we do that? Through a weird obstacle course full of bouncy jellyfish. So the main part of this level is just moving along a path and making it past any of the obstacles along the way. You'll have to move up and down these tendrils to dodge electrical hazards. There's plenty of long jumps in this level with these pink rings that help boost you along. They're pretty consistent, but if you mistime the jumps into the rings, you can easily fall straight to your death. Or just get stuck in them. It's a magical combat, I don't know how gravity works here. I really like how this level looks, it's kind of like a mashup of sci-fi and deep sea, the music adds a nice ominous vibe to it as well. Well after losing a couple of smiley faces we make it to the end of the platforming section, here we take a lift back up and proceed to Stan's house. What does that letterbox say, Stan Thinman? Stan Thinman? Oh Stan Thinman, of course. Well, here's Stan, the OG 1997 Slenderman. I don't really know what the story is with this mini boss, but Stan really wants to kill us with his fly swatter, so we better get to work. This boss area has some fire magic pickups, so just grab one of them and just go to town on Stan while keeping some distance. Once Stan is dead, you jump onto the chair cushion and rotate to the end of the level. Yeah, I don't know. Sticking with the ocean theme of the last level, we have Oyster the Oyster. I love when the levels and games have names rather than just being called level 1 or level 2. I mean, Oyster the Oyster is really weird, but eh, at least it stands out. This level mostly takes place inside a cave, or is it a fish belly? Whatever it is, it's giving me Jabu Jabu belly vibes, and I'm here for it. This level has a few new gimmicks, bubbles that pop after a certain number of jumps, these weird jellyfish things that suck you up, some of the floor and wall tiles have this weird shimmering effect which is pretty cool. The whole level is pretty cool actually, the music here especially, it's one of my favourite tracks in the whole game. If you haven't noticed already, I'm a big fan of this game's soundtrack by the way, and we are at the point in the game where the music starts experimenting with a lot of new styles and genres. It still sounds like pandemonium, but the soundtrack here isn't afraid to be as out there and wacky as the level designs, and look, it's it's still early days yet. Yeah. Later on you'll get to use these plants which bring you up through the level. Oh, a giant spinning ring of coins! you love to see it. There's a few outside parts in the level too, nothing we didn't already see in the last level though if I'm being honest. At the end of the level we gotta hit this time switch and have to quickly platform back to the other side of the area before the door closes. The timing here is pretty strict so you gotta nail it perfectly or maybe just don't jump at the last part every time like an idiot. 
After that, we platform over some more bouncy jellyfish to reach the end of the level next to a goon in a gas mask and some fairies. Which means it's time for... Welcome to the spooky alien jigsaw forest. If you like angry trees, the color red and puzzles, this is the place for you. Honestly, this is an okay level. It's not as good as the last few, but it does still have its moments. One of the gimmicks in this level is these weird light sources coming from out of the tree that lets you hover up whenever you're inside them. I do love this level's commitment to the puzzle theming. All the trees, enemies, floor tiles, they're all puzzle pieces. How this place ended up on a comet, I have no idea, but sure, look, it's, it's their fantasy. We're just playing through it. Shortly into the level, we come across a mini boss fight against none other than Zorsha, the goon queen herself. This is uh, Zorsha, by the way, in case you're wondering. Quite the character design. Definitely blue. This fight is a bit of a letdown. You're meant to jump on her head, but I just cheesed her with the fireball. Either way, it would have been a really easy short fight. We grab the key, which teleports us to a new area. Then we jump over a few more bouncy platforms, past the spooky tree and his glowing platforms, and onwards to our next level on one of my personal favorites. So first, the music for this level, Stone Cold Banger. Not many people can pull off pan flutes and tubular bells this well, but it's hands down my favorite in the game. So the Temple of Nori, this is what I'd imagine an Unreal Tournament map transferred into a platforming level would look like. The level starts off pretty normal. You've got to push the turtle so you can fight the mantis. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory, really. There's a very satisfying bat platform challenge here if you want to net yourself some extra smileys. When you eventually make your way into the temple, you'll be introduced to this level's main hazard. Now don't worry, I've played Fall Guys a ton, I know what I'm doing here. This level has a couple of branching paths you can take, but the correct path forward is usually telegraphed pretty well, so it's not like you're ever going to get lost. There's a fun bonus area up here as well if you want to race some monks up to the top of a platform for some extra smileys. I like the way the perspective changes with your vision on the rotating hazards. It's a pretty good challenge to keep up with as the level progresses. It got me one or two times at least. Towards the end of the level, you'll come across a long path filled with swinging axes, fire hazards, enemies. It's tough going, but you do get a fire magic pickup to make things easier. You can also watch in real time as I remember that you can change the direction of your fire shots. Hey, it gets hard remembering things once you turn 25. It's just a downhill slope from there. Once you make it past the last set of swinging axes and balls, congrats! Things are about to get weird again. Who's ready to fight the freshly hatched giant egg with hands and feet? I know these little guys are excited at least. These are meant to be baby eggs, by the way. I don't know. Whatever they are, they're cute. I like them. So this boss has its own gimmick, and it's being unable to move horizontally. This fight is pretty boring, honestly. The egg only has a few attacks, most of which you can easily duck under, and one or two that you need to jump over. Each attack is heavily telegraphed, so dodging the attacks themselves isn't too hard. You can only damage the boss by using fire magic, which thankfully spawns infinitely above you. The problem is though that the window you have for hitting the boss is quite small, and it does take quite a number of hits to go down, so this fight can drag on for a little bit. Easy enough fight, just kinda boring. The music here is kinda bland too, not exactly bad or anything, but a low point compared to what came before it. Anyway, once you beat the egg, he flies off and crashes through a wall before he, uh... Oh, nice, a crown. Well, now that we've explored the surface of the Comet of Infinite Possibilities and become ruler of the egg people, it's time for Huevos Libertad, which I believe means free eggs in Spanish. I also read that it's a euphemism for free testicles, and look, knowing this game, I believe him. This part of the game sees us gradually descending into the comet itself, and as it turns out, the comet is set up with quite a lot of facilities, the first of which is this little mining village. In this level, you can free your captured egg friends from cages and use them as platforms when they appear throughout the level. They also say up whenever you jump on them, which is real cute.
This level has some interesting features. Dogs are here for some reason. The fishmen are back as well. They think these are lamps. They look like lamps. You can go into these weird patchwork houses and teleport around to loads of different sections within the level. The jellyfish once again are back and they are used as handbars this time, which I mean, good for them. Jellyfish are getting lots of screen time in this game. This level isn't too long, but you see that facility in the background when we get to the end? Guess where we're off to next? I don't know who lives on the comet, but unsurprisingly, someone has managed to build a plant to drain all of its natural resources. Our egg friends are back and hanging out in this green ooze. That probably can't be good for them. The House of Pipes has a lot of two different things, pipes and hanging. A good chunk of this level is dodging different hazards while moving along hanging platforms. There's some big towers you gotta climb up, dealing with the change in perspective while you also gotta dodge hanging hazards. It's uh, it's a struggle. I also chased this smiley for way too long before accepting I was never gonna catch it. Sometimes you just gotta learn to let things go. Eventually you move on and you get a good look at the comet's core as you move deeper to the plant. Doesn't look like the comet's doing so good to be honest. The music in Pipe House is also another favourite of mine, it has some definite IDM influence in it. The current set of levels stick to a kind of sci-fi industrial theme and the music for each level definitely suits them very well. If you work your way up to this hidden key you get teleported to a very purple bonus area. Very nice. Some of the later platforming in this level can get pretty tricky. You can really feel the game starting to ramp up the difficulty at this point. The last obstacle especially has some very rough timing, but I was lucky to make it out with a single hit point, only to be rewarded with another super health for my troubles. Anyway, that's Pipe House. Our next level is uh, a little different. Oh, intense music, you know what that means. We're getting chased by a giant robot. That's right, it's a chase level. It's pretty fun, you got these boxes to bounce on, a few obstacles to get over, nothing too taxing until you turn around the first corner. Oh no, did I say this was a chase level? No, I meant it's a tank level. Menacing giant robot? No longer a problem, we've got a tank now. Fuck you! Giant robot. Fuck you! This here is Pandemonium making the most of the fact that they can pretty much do whatever they want with the levels at this stage. The first game lets you turn into animals from time to time, this game lets you drive a tank and listen to drum and bass. It's basically the same. I'm very much of the same opinion with tanks and games as I am with mechs. Their inclusion generally just makes every game better. Now this rule doesn't apply to say actual games about tanks, but Gex riding in a little tank for example? Now that's money. This level is a nice change in gameplay. You can move your tank forward and back and also rotate the turret to shoot at any angle and into the foreground and background as well. It's a careful balance of dodging incoming fire and adjusting your aim on the fly to hit enemies and switches all across the level. This level is also pretty long and quite tough. The tank can take a few shots, but if you're careless, you'll end up dead in no time. At the end of the level, you have to fight a giant terror full of guns and glowing weak points. Definitely the hardest part of the level, but if you've gotten used to aiming your shots with the turret, you shouldn't have too much trouble here. Moving on. We're getting deeper into the comments facilities now and next up we have Fantabulous which as the name suggests features a lot of fans and may or may not be fabulous. The level starts out hot with an almost immediate bonus area, followed by a little fight with Darth Vader. I mean, he lost the Force Lightning Battle fair and square, you all saw it. In spite of our little fight just there, there's actually very few enemies in this level, instead it's just full of stage hazards. Your goal here is to reach the top of the structure, and as you can imagine, the higher you get, the more hazardous it becomes to your overall health and well-being. Eventually, you'll reach the center of the structure with a center piece that rotates you to different parts of the area. Each part usually has a small platforming section or puzzle that unlocks another part and then you just complete these sections in order one by one until you eventually make your way to the top. When you get there, you see a big green button. Uh oh. So yeah, now we gotta escape the structure before it blows up by using this flying lift. This section is actually really tough. The time window for dodging these electric hazards is really, really quite tight. I'm just lucky I had all that extra health to cover for how bad I am. Eventually, we reach the top of the structure and move on to my favorite boss in the game. Okay, so we start the level and uh, it's Breakout. 
The game's now breakout. But where's the boss? Oh, a mech. It's not that cool since we can't pilot it, but it's, but it's fine. Now it's time to fight the boss through the ancient art of breakout from the back of a moving vehicle. This is pretty self-explanatory, Mr. Schnobelin, Schnobelin, whoever he is, he'll shoot balls at you which you need to deflect with your paddle. You can also change the angle of the paddle using the L1 and R1 buttons. This boss fight can actually be really tough. Trying to keep up with all the balls and angling yourself the correct way to hit the boss can take a little while to get down. If you miss any balls, that's also a strike against you and you can take roughly 5 hits before you're sent back to the beginning. But once you start getting into the swing of things and you're deflecting ball after ball in a row, I gotta tell you, this level's pretty great. Also, this is the best boss music in the game, without a doubt, no question. After a few minutes, we take Mr. Schnobelin out, and usually after the boss is when we move on to the next act of the game, but we've got one more level to visit here before we get there. They only went and gave us a bloody mech level. Honestly, they spoiled me. A mech level and a tank level in a PS1 platformer? What a time to be alive. Actually, it's, it's 2020, I take that back. So the mech controls as you would hope. We've got a ranged attack and a shield activated by crouching, and also a jet assisted jump for some good height. But before we actually get to start the level, the Goon Queen is um, in a big drill, heading for the Comet's core. That's not good. So now we are following the drill down towards the core, which leads to this trippy tunnel section that kind of plays like some sort of nightmare version of Space Harrier with a drum and bass soundtrack. You've got tons of stuff to dodge and loads of coins to collect. Sometimes these rockets fire off, which telegraph a big flame hazard, which requires you to position quite carefully to avoid them. Throughout the tunnel, you'll fight other mechs blocking the path. Your mech will bounce off certain platforms and blockades, so you have to try position yourself to hit the enemy while also dodging their shots while bouncing around in the process. It sure is something. Eventually we do make it into the Comet's core for a platforming section. The platforming here is pretty simple thanks to the mech's rocket powered long jump, but you do get to put your mech to good use by fighting lots of enemy mechs along the way. Just make sure to use the shield to avoid taking too much unnecessary damage. Eventually we catch up to the drill and after some very carefully aimed jumps, we are back in heading deeper into the core. This part here is like the last tunnel section, just a little bit harder again. Lots more hazards to avoid, bouncy mech battles, you know the stuff. Eventually we catch up to the drill and just start running around inside it trying to blow it up from within. The drill itself has its own platforming section and more mechs to fight. This level honestly throws quite a lot at you. Eventually we manage to destroy the drill from within but the Goon Queen still manages to escape into the core in her little pod so we've got no choice really but to just follow up behind her. I'm sure only good things can come from falling into the cosmic void, right? Here we say goodbye to our mech and enter the Zol Train. Zool Train? Zol Train? Whatever this place is, it's, it's weird. This is the point in the game where they just go straight into the realm of psychedelia with the level themes and music. I don't know what you'd call this genre. Acid jazz, maybe? I don't know. Whatever it is, it's, it's weird. And great. Everything in this level is just a little bit strange. The coins move away from you, there's a giant Sid pogo stick in the background of the level. You get to dodge these smiling moons in front of the giant Fargus heads before you eventually move into the giant Fargus mouth so you can come out of the other side and drop onto the giant talking legs. Moving on. You come across a new enemy type here, the wizard goons. Nothing too special about them other than that they take a little while to kill because when you bop them on the head they teleport away before showing up again. These guys usually open up locked gates when you kill them so make sure not to ignore them. The level here just continues to get weirder as it goes on. You gotta take the giant legs to go over the hazards below and look whoever thought it was a good idea to put two wizards and a door in this section, I, I hate you. Once we enter the next Fargus head we move on to another mini boss battle with the Goon Queen. We don't have fire magic to help us out this time but it's still pretty easy, you just gotta hang above her and drop onto her head a few times. You can also get a couple of extra hits in if you time your bounces properly. If you happen to fall below you can use these small red platforms to bounce back up. Rinse and repeat until she goes away and then take the satisfying drop down to reach the real life Zoltrain. 
Finally, we get to meet up with our little egg friends again and take them on a cosmic train ride. Here you've got to maneuver around chattering teeth and giant goon heads. Pretty standard, really. This bit's actually pretty tough, but it's also quite short. Now, in spite of that, I managed to kill pretty much all of the little pink friends and myself at the very end. One more quick try though and the level is complete. And would you believe it? This is the first time I've collected enough coins to access the game's bonus level. you think we would have seen it by now, but sure look, better late than never. Pandemonium 2's bonus level is a lot like Pandemonium 1's bonus level, and by that I mean it's pretty much the exact same, only it looks a little bit cooler this time around. This level is infamous for being pretty much impossible. There's lots of coins and extra smileys to obtain, but good luck getting far enough to actually get any of them. On paper this is pretty simple, you ride a board on a slope track and you gotta duck and jump to avoid the obstacles in your path. Now, this wouldn't be too bad, but you also got this very fast moving gate chasing behind you and if you get hit, you're sent back to the start of the stage. You've got three tries to get as much as you can while you're here and needless to say, I did not get very much. There is still a lot to like in this level though, the obstacles you have to duck under are ducks, which is a nice touch, and the music and visuals here are really cool too, but you need to play this level quite a lot to actually stand the chance of beating it successfully, so this is why I usually don't bother too much with it. Anyway, with that, it's time to move on, and if you thought the last level was weird... Welcome to the weirdest level in Pandemonium 2. From the visuals to the music, Lick the Toad is Pandemonium 2 at its psychedelic peak. Even the way the coins and collectibles bounce around erratically here, everything is just a little bit off to say the least. You start by taking out two wizards and avoiding whatever this buzzsaw thing is, and soon we quickly get spit into a... Uh... Oh. Oh, I'm not feeling so good. Next up, we fly along the Stingray bird things. As long as you time your jumps from platform to platform, this part isn't too bad. Next up, we get spit out into this dark glowing area with um, these friends to dodge. I love the little noise they make whenever they pop out. The final part of this level is a race against this um, flying thing. You've got to move pretty quickly to beat it, so you'll need to dodge obstacles going down the slide, run along the tongue pathway and avoid the teeth so you can make it to the eyeballs, then climb up the clock, dodge the Newton's cradle, then run along the path and avoid the clapping hands so you can use the beast bubbles to bring you up to more hands until you finally reach the end of the level and then you die. <sighs> Okay, so we do that all over again, and if you're quick enough, an anvil will crush the fly, and there you go, level complete. What the fuck is this? And with that, we've managed to make it all the way to the very last platforming level in the game, and this level isn't like anything that came before it. This thing is a, uh, a very different beast. Well, here we are, the bitter end. This is Pandemonium 2's final platforming level, and true to form, this game has one final trick up its sleeve before you think you've seen everything it has to offer. I'm not quite sure what this level is meant to be, but the music gives off the vibe that it's alive and wants you dead, so tread lightly. So, the bitter end. It's a big level, roughly the size of three normal levels put together. And not only is it big, it's a non-linear level as well. You see this map and the little tiny X? That's us. We've got to make it to the area in the top right, but guess what? It's blocked off. And the only way to access it is to explore the large area, hunting for switches to unlock more areas, which will unlock more areas, and so on and so on, until the final area eventually opens up. Not only is this the longest level in the game, clocking in at anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour depending on how good you are, this is easily also the hardest level in the game, so if you wander in here with only a couple of smileys and you lose them all, you're back to the beginning of the level to start all over again. Now, it may be mediocre, but thankfully I stocked up with about 20 smileys heading into this level, so we should be safe. This level is split into different sections, which kind of act like mini levels in themselves, and they are all separated by this massive vertical hub in the middle that allows you to travel the long distances up or down to reach new areas. I don't want to bore you by going into the nitty gritty details, but to beat this level, you basically need to go up and down the entire level multiple times, hitting switches to unlock new areas, which 
how switches that unlock new sections and old areas, only the old areas now have more enemies and traps in them, and they're all really weird and difficult. You gotta dodge tons of difficult saw blade traps with erotic patterns, complete a tiny platform puzzle in this weird area where the wall grows an eye and tries to kill you. Shortly after this, you have a fight with the giant eye. The eye also thinks it's in a bullet hell shooter, and I mean, it's pandemonium too, why not? You get to run through this weird tunnel full of deadly teeth. I don't like these teeth. On the way to the next area, we managed to come across one of the most satisfying parts of the game. You love to see it. We go to this next area, hit the switch, and uh... Oh, the walls are trying to close in on me now. That's cool. This is fine. This is all fine. All of this is fine. There's a section where you, um... Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you what's going on here. And my favorite part, where you get a pair of moon boots and are now able to jump incredibly long distances. I kind of love that this game manages to fit in one more throwaway mechanic into this already really weird and varied level. Just be uh, careful on the tiny platforms later on. After you've gone through nearly every area at least twice over with an ever increasing difficulty curve, you can finally moon jump your way over this massive gap to reach the end of the level. This particular run of the level only took me 45 minutes, but I did somehow manage to collect enough treasure to get the bonus level again, so I guess it went pretty well. Once again, I am still awful at the bonus level, just in case you're wondering. That leaves us with only one thing left to do, and I sure hope the Goon Queen hasn't already reached the Comet's core, because that would be bad. Oh, look at that, I think we made it in time. Oh, no, actually, she was just kind of waiting there the whole time. So the Goon Queen absorbs the Comet's power and is now a Buddha. Good for her, I think that's a big deal in certain places. We jump in behind her, things get weird for a bit, and now we are flying around fighting the Buddha. This boss has two phases. The first part where you fly around trying to shoot the green gems dotted on its body is pretty fun. Your character is always falling, but you can fly up by using the D-pad at any time. That's why it kind of seems like I'm bouncing around. I'm just tapping up to try to keep myself level with the targets. Once you destroy all the green gems, we enter the second phase. Honestly, I expected something even weirder at this stage, but I mean, giant Buddha head with a trippy background, I'll, I'll take it. This part here is just fighting the boss's head one on one. It's kind of similar to the Egg King fight in that you only get a small window to damage the boss, and most of the fight is just spent dodging its attacks. At least since you can move around fully in this fight, it is somewhat more engaging, even if it does drag on for a little bit. Keep firing at the green gem whenever it's visible, and eventually the head will go down. From here, we are teleported on top of the head where we take a quick victory run over the Buddha's incredibly long tongue, pick up some items just for the fun of it, and follow the end sign that popped out of the dead Buddha's arse to finish the game. What the fuck is this? Okay, so here's Nikki's ending. So I guess Nikki is the comet now. Probably not a bad life to be fair. And yes, in case you're wondering, Fargus does have his own ending too. Wake up, Nikki. Nikki, <gasps> wake up. Wake up. Wake up, Nikki. Wake up, Nikki. Wake up, Nikki. Wake 
I love that Sid hated this reality so much that he killed himself through sheer force of will. I mean, that's that's impressive. And also, I bet you won't believe what the Teletubbies baby looks like now. Well, that was Pandemonium 2, and as you can see, it's kind of like the first Pandemonium. Only this is its edgy twin sibling who likes dropping acid and listening to Square Pusher in a small room with some glow-in-the-dark posters. It's a straightforward 2.5D platformer that plays really well, but also happens to be really, really weird, and I love it because of it. There's so much variety packed into each of the 19 levels, and every level feels very different from the last, from the visuals to the music to the wide variety of different gameplay gimmicks. It's worth playing just to see what the game's gonna throw at you next. And also, we haven't looked at it yet, but I want to give a special shout out to this game's level select screen. This may not seem like much to you, but I adore when games give you these long linear paths to follow from level to level with unique set pieces for each of the game's locations. This is one of my favorites in any game, and it's kind of like running through a mini version of the entire thing. The little drum and bass tune that plays in the background is great too. Okay, so I guess we should wrap this up. Pandemonium 2 is a lot of fun. It's usually pretty cheap to pick up a physical PS1 copy online, but it's also available to download as a PS1 classic through the PSN, and even over on GOG for the PC players. So if you want to try it for the price, I don't think you can go wrong. Anyway, thank you very, very much for watching. I will see you next time with a whole bunch of Marvel games and maybe another weird unloved PS1 game down the line. Wonder which one that could be.